Namaskar everyone. Welcome to the Saraswati Sangam Project Eminent Scholar Lecture Series. It is our absolute honor to have Professor Subhash Kak as our eminent speaker today. But before I introduce our speaker, I want to share a little bit about the Saraswati Sangam Project. The Saraswati Sangam Project is a center of excellence dedicated to advancing and supporting research and dissemination of scientific inquiry grounded <coughs> in Vedic knowledge. Saraswati Sangam project in short TISP has several threads of activities to serve its mission. We have original content on this YouTube channel. Please search for Saraswati Sangam on YouTube. We also support others efforts uh, such as Prachyam documentary series on Indian contributions to the world and most recently, Anuj and Garvit's AKTK documentary project. We have recently launched a writing competition uh, with, along with a mentor program, which is designed to facilitate and enable youngsters in their educational <coughs> pursuit and career uh, plans, aligned with and empowered by shared roots of our ancient heritage. The deadline for the writing competition is around the corner. So please reach out in your uh, network to encourage youngsters to, uh, to write about contributions uh, of our ancestors to scientific inquiries. This also confers awards such as the Eminent Scholar Award and Research Scholarships, as well as grassroots research by Acharyas at various gur Gurkuls and is currently in the process of developing a Hindu science program for high school students. Today, we are truly honored to have Professor Subhash Kak as our eminent scholar lecture series speaker. Professor Kak is a Regents Professor at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma. He's also a distinguished scholar at Chapman University and is the author for 20 books. His research is uh, in the fields of computer science, quantum theory, and consciousness, very multidisciplinary. Professor Kark has written extensively in the uh, topic of social impact of artificial intelligence. And related to this, he has been member of a committee set up by SRI International to determine if computers in the future will become conscious. He has served on academic advisory committees of the Smithsonian and NIST, as well as, as, a, as well as advisory board of several technology companies. Professor Kart is featured on one of the, as one of the interviewees in the areas of mathematics and information in the long-standing PBS series, Closer to Truth. Professor Kart very kindly and generously makes time to uh, appear in various forums and presents uh, very deep and complex topics with much lucidity. So it's very hard to not be in awe of Professor Kark's knowledge uh, and willingness to share it. We at TISP are uh, very privileged to honor uh, uh, and confer uh, Professor Kark with the 2022 TISP Eminent Scholar Award in recognition of his contributions to advance ancient Vedic knowledge through the rigor of scientific inquiry and enhance the present day awareness of the vast knowledge heritage of India. Today, uh, Professor Kark is gonna talk about Kashmir and the science of consciousness. So I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Kark and very eagerly look forward to your knowledge today. Thank you, thank you Aparnaji. I'm delighted uh, to be a part of the Saraswati Sangam uh, lecture series. Um, the topic is very interesting and of course I'm very pleased uh, at the scope uh, of uh, the various activities that your um, foundation does and I'm sure uh, uh, it's going to help everybody uh, advance their understanding of not only ancient uh, history but also um, get insight into um, the unfolding of um, history as uh, it's occurring right in front of our eyes. So um, the topic, uh, Kashmir and the science of consciousness. Um, Kashmir, because um, about uh, 2000 years ago, uh, something uh, very impressive occurred there. 
um, which uh, led to very deep insights uh, in the area of consciousness. But what is Kashmir and why am I uh, um, juxtaposing it with uh, consciousness? Well, I'm from Kashmir. I was born there. I was raised there. So I know the place very well. I know its history very well. And it's gone through um, some very tragic um, um, tragic um, background or tragic history for uh, a lot of time. There have been several uh, exoduses from there, the most recently uh, 32 years ago. Um, and so there is a lot of violence, um, but um, um, as, um, as belonging to the tradition, um, I feel uh, it's very important for us to keep on talking about uh, um, what um, emerged there, which is of relevance not only to Kashmiris and to Indians, but to everybody across the world, as I'll try to establish uh, right now or today. Now, uh, Kashmir, first of all, very briefly, uh, the northernmost uh, state of India uh, was a great center of Sanskrit learning. Uh, and for about uh, 1200 or 1300, 1400 years from uh, a few centuries BC to 1300, it was one of the great uh, um, centers of research in different fields and scholarship in subjects ranging from literature to music theory to, um, uh, to, to medicine, that is Ayurveda, to um, do art um, and um, to um, poetry, uh, to architecture, all kinds of stuff. Some of the most impressive uh, encyclopedias and books uh, were written there. Also, uh, before I forget, perhaps the greatest uh, story books ever written, in my view, and I, as someone who knows a lot of world uh, uh, li literature, I can say um, you know, with some confidence that the most interesting uh, storybook ever written outside of the uh, of the uh, the great Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana is a book called Yoga Vasishta. It's a huge book, twenty four thousand shlokas in Sanskrit, which is really an amazing book, uh, not only to be viewed as a storybook but also as one with the deepest uh, knowledge that there is and especially knowledge related to the nature of uh, consciousness. So some of you might want to explore, explore it. There's a lucid translation that was published by State University of New York Press 20, 25 years ago. So it's very easily available uh, in the uh, US. Now, um, science of consciousness. Uh, there are two ways of looking at it. One from a contemporary perspective and uh, Right now, uh, some of the smartest uh, scientists in the world are trying to see uh, as to how to understand this phenomenon. What is it that makes a complex system such as the brain uh, come to have this capacity to be aware? And so the question is, uh, do we approach it from the perspective of uh, complex system theory? Because the brain is a complex system. Uh, or do we approach it from the perspective of neuroscience because there could be certain other phenomena going on in the brain uh, beyond um, what um, complex system theory tells us, which is responsible for it? Or do we approach it from the perspective of physics? Uh, because in physics, as especially quantum mechanics, which is the deepest theory of physics, uh, we know that uh, uh, the pioneers of the field about a hundred years ago, uh, thought that the best way to understand uh, physical reality was to see it as a, um, as a kind of a dichotomy where there are two aspects to it. One is the physical structures uh, governed by laws. Uh, and on the other side is consciousness. On the other side is the observer. So that the observer and the physical system are two sides of the same reality. So in other words, and this is uh, what uh, the orthodox uh, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics does um, is to view uh, consciousness as a parallel entity, uh, uh, parallel to the physical system. Now, this has also been um, um, 
noted by philosophers and historians of quantum mechanics that this is perfectly consistent with the Vedantic view of reality. And Vedanta, as we know, is um, this um, uh, very deep uh, view of reality which emerged in India, um, going back to the Vedas. And since the Vedas are something that you want to do uh, in the Saraswati Sangam Foundation. So this is one of those uh, other links. So uh, the, the greatest uh, scholars and the deepest scholars have on countless occasions repeated that um, Vedanta and quantum mechanics are perfectly consistent with each other. Um, now, while that may be so, and not everybody agrees, there, is, there are minority uh, views who say that we should be able to explain, uh, uh, explain uh, uh, consciousness also as a, as, as a phenomenon which emerges out of the working of the mathematical apparatus associated with quantum mechanics. In other words, we should be able to show consciousness itself as a property of materiality. So this is a minority and uh, they haven't uh, gone uh, uh, very far, although uh, you know they have been working quite hard uh, over 20 or 30 years, but that uh, whole project uh, seems to have hit some kind of a wall. And in fact, uh, um, six, seven years ago, there was a big, uh, uh, initiative by DARPA uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, to explore the question as to whether um, not now or not necessarily in 20, 50, 100 years, but sometime in the future, computers will become conscious. And as a part of this, this is just a select group of 30, 40 people, some physicists and neuroscientists and philosophers and computer scientists. We met several times, um, week-long workshops, and uh, one of those workshops was in Cambridge, UK, and we held a informal poll and 50%, about 50% of the participants, about 30 odd participants, thought that computers will eventually become conscious. And these were the people who believe that um, if you are able to embody more and more modules in the brain into a device, then at some point, once the complexity crosses a certain level, suddenly machines will become conscious. But the others, so these were mostly people who believe in strong AI or whose understanding of reality is, uh, is as a machine, as a mechanism, right? Because that's one view, uh, which is the old classical view, which is, this is not the quantum mechanical view. And as we know, classical physics was sort of superseded by quantum mechanics. Now, the other 50% who thought that this was not going to happen were those uh, who worked in many of these different fields, or me, I was one of those who think that uh, the workings of the brain itself has aspects which are, which go beyond just the activity going on in the neural uh, connections. So it's not just complexity, there's something more, and that goes right to the uh, the very heart of this problem, that uh, that consciousness is not a property, is a physical property uh, of uh, of a machine, and um, and and so this brings us to back to the Vedas because of the Vedas, for example, uh, in the Mundaka Upanishad, um, and the Upanishads tell us uh, a lot about uh, what this consciousness, their the view of consciousness is. In fact, um, uh, it's generally accepted. The Vedas themselves represent a science of consciousness. And I'll come back to Kashmir and its Kashmiri connection in a short while. So uh, in the uh, Mundak Upanishad, for example, it's stated that you have two kinds of sciences, uh, apara and para. Apara sciences are those which are based on relationships, properties, conceptual or physical and you look at their connections and you write them down and once you write them down first of all you understand them and and so these um, sciences um, are amenable to linguistic description so you can talk about hey what are these relationships you know what happens 
if certain such stuff happens because the vedas do assert again and again that the physical universe evolves according to laws this is called ritam or rit uh, in fact the word ritual uh, is associated with this root itself so everything in the physical universe is law based which is what the vedas believe but uh, on the other side this other sciences that uh, this upanishad says are the para sciences so apara are whatever you see microbiology physics uh, chemistry they are all apara para is the science of the sub, of the subjective of the subject of the experiencing self of awareness the science of awareness of consciousness is para so this is very clearly stated that para cannot be reduced to apara so para is not reductionist or reductionable right you cannot reduce it to properties of things so para is not something that can be measured because whatever is a property of a material object should be measured and therefore you should be able to then say that such and such are the properties this is how the properties change right but consciousness although there are states of awareness we do uh, know that a subject could be groggy so one's awareness is not clear but if one is uh, aware completely then of course you are conscious and uh, this this is the idea in fact which goes to uh, the very heart of what reality is uh because uh reality whatever physical reality we know is perceived in consciousness right we haven't we don't know the solar system we don't actually go and touch the suns or the stars or the planets etc everything is in our mind so consciousness from that perspective is primary uh now the question arises uh the consciousness that we have and this is one of those uh, subjects which was discussed in our meetings uh, five or six years ago the dark organized meetings was that the consciousness in our brain is it uh, is that all there is to it because then it's related only to each individual right now you have your consciousness i have my consciousness um, and and perhaps whatever its mysterious origin there is all there is to it and the ground stuff of reality is this vast physical universe right so this is one way of looking at it the other way of looking at it which is the vedic view is that yes indeed each one of us has our subjective consciousness but there is a cosmic consciousness there is uh, of which we are only um, projections and this cons cosmic consciousness covers the entire cosmos and the physical universe in this um, sort of mysterious way is contained in this cosmic consciousness now what the vedas say there are what are called the great statements in the vedas and they're called mahavakyas you find them in the upanishads and the mahavakyas uh, repeat again and again for example um, one of the Mah mahavakyas is and this is an aitareya upanishad is pragyanam um, uh, pragyanam uh, brahma that intuition itself takes you to the brahman which is the cosmos or uh, in yajurveda in uh, brihad aranik upanishad it is aham brahmasmi aham i am uh, brahman now what does it really mean um, or or uh, before uh, let me give you a third one which is the one which uh, uh inspired uh, the creator of quantum mechanics uh erwin schrodinger uh, and in his own autobiography he says that this is what gave him the clue to the very nature of quantum mechanics and you can read this in his uh, famous book what is life uh where he speaks about it in an autobiographical manner he says the mahavakya which is from mandukya upanishad which is i am atma brahm gave him the clue what it says is that this atman is the cosmos now what does that really mean atman is your consciousness which is what gives you autonomy in fact the word atman is related to autonomy perhaps in an etymological sense this atman which is your consciousness is the entire cosmos and what this is um hinting at 
is that uh, this consciousness, uh, like uh, just like you have one sun uh, in uh, in the outer universe, and you can take a million uh, pots of water and see the disk of that sun uh, shining in each of those pots during the day, of course, and uh, yeah, and likewise. Uh, and this is something that Schrodinger got uh, and stressed uh, again and again, you have the same consciousness, one unity, which shines in the minds of all the living beings, all the sentient beings. Now, the pots of water, the amount of light that you will see there, or the way you'll see the disk of the sun would depend upon, well, is the pot of light uh, exposed to the sun directly, or are there uh, covers of cloth on it? If there is a cover of cloth, or there are obstructions, then you won't see it very clearly, right? Uh, then you'll see it only faintly. So the whole idea of consciousness in the Vedas is that our habits and the very uh, physical structure of our brain uh, uh, creates uh, certain uh, coverings. In Sanskrit, this is called avarans. These coverings um, uh, sort of um, affect uh, the light um, and that light doesn't all go through and therefore you don't see reality with the same clarity. So in other words, what is it that is different between me or you or somebody else or between all different individuals? If we are, because in this view, each uh, sentient being is the same. We are the same being in a very mysterious way. But of course we have our own individual histories and it's our individual history and our habits and our conditioning and our prejudices and biases, uh, which become a lens through which we see reality. And it's because of those biases, biases um, and uh, those prejudices and our conditioning that, uh, that some people are not able to see reality as well, or some people do unspeakable things because they are conditioned in such a way uh, that their mind uh, is full of darkness. Because if you cover this uh, pot of light, if that's how we look at our brains, with darkness, then any, any human being uh, in that kind of a situation would be able to do or would uh, or could in principle do terrible things. You know, just as the nature of a, of a beast is to kill, uh, human beings themselves can become beast-like if they haven't sensed this light. And this is the reason why uh, what are called samskaras or habits, uh, inscribed habits of interaction with reality, which are inscribed in your mind um, through education when you're a child, become so fundamental. And that really makes all the difference between what somebody might do something horrible to women, for example, in Afghanistan or in any other country, um, uh, or uh, somebody who is open and, you know, treats everybody as an equal, because we are all equal if you have, we have the same consciousness within each sentient being. So this completely uh, changes our, uh, our relationship with reality and also makes uh, accessible to us uh, uh, knowledge which is uh, uh, potentially available to everybody, uh, there for everybody. Now, let, let, this brings us to Kashmir. Now, what happened in Kashmir uh, in the early centuries um, of, um, of our um, current, uh, system, uh, you know, chron chronological system, um, but early century CE, um, was uh, that uh, this, uh, this whole understanding that we have in the Vedas was then uh, written much more directly. Uh, and in fact, this, we, we have, uh, um, evidence related to it from, from art, uh, from many philosophical commentaries that they've written, um, like Vishnu, the Hadmottar Quran, and so on. Um, but later on, uh, 
uh, a text which is called the Shiva Sutras uh, was uh, was presented by by the sage and in the Shiva Sutra uh, the very first sutra says Chaitanyam Atma that this uh, awareness itself is Atman because one could say that what is Atman? You know, if you look at uh, Indian texts and you look at their translations by philosophers in the last 50, 100 years, they say, well, Atma is a soul, right? Of course, you know, you have, you go to the Bhagavad Gita, Atman is everything, it uh, doesn't die, and, and we put on different dresses uh, from one life to another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then, what is the word Atman? And normally uh, it's uh, translated as soul or used to be. And then it becomes, um, once again, something that you don't understand because what is the soul, right? Um, that here, um, the soul, because in certain conceptions, you have the idea that the soul uh, on the day of judgment will go to heaven and you get your rewards for whatever you've done. If you're a good believer, then you live ever, everlasting life. It's an idea uh, where materiality associated with your experience in this world is transposed to a mythical future, right? Soul is something which is your true self, right? So that's what we mean. Uh, but, but really, it's, it's something that uh, uh, nobody understands the word soul. Now, what uh, Vasugupta did in um, uh, Shiva Sutras by saying Chaitanyam Atma, he said, uh, your awareness itself is your Atma. And, and as the Mahavakyas that we mentioned before, which also say the same thing, because when you say, I am Atma Brahma, or you say, Tattvam Asi, that you, in Tattvam Asi is uh, putting it somewhat differently, that what you're looking for, uh, that thou art. It has all possible uh, aspects that you can imagine, which is uh, a different way of saying the same thing as Aham Brahmasmi. I am, my awareness is, is the entire cosmos because everything exists in your consciousness, right? Or I am Atma Brahm. Or um, uh, Chaitanyam Atma, as in the Shiva Sutras, exactly identical, not uh, any different from what the Vedas say. So what, what it does is, this is a slightly different perspective, a linguistic perspective. What it does is that it takes you from, um, from something much more metaphysical or abstract or mysterious to something that you can relate to directly that, hey, my awareness is what there is. Because, you know, ultimately uh, in looking for the nature of reality, how do we go about doing so? Um, you know, what is reality? What is this physical cosmos related to us? We are a speck of dust on a speck of dust. The earth itself is a speck of dust. Not only that, there are all kinds of mysteries. For example, uh, the most advanced theories of physics that we have right now um, say that uh, we cannot explain 95% of the physical universe because about 67% of his dark matter and dark uh, is dark energy, which of, of which there is no evidence as, as of now. And 28% is dark matter. The two of them together is 95% then three point or 4.5 percent is interstellar gases you know between the stars so that makes it 99.5 percent so current physics and cosmology can explain only 0.5 percent of the universe right so who are we we've made a lot of progress doing our sciences in the last uh, couple of hundred years but we ultimately know very little we don't know in the physical cosmos as to why the earth is where it is of course we can explain the motions of the planets around the sun but we cannot explain the motions of the galaxies in, in uh, within uh, the stars within the galaxies and that's the reason why you have to postulate dark matter and then you can't explain why the whole cosmos or the whole universe is accelerating in its expansion for which you have to postulate dark energy, right? So we don't really understand the physical universe. We don't understand 
uh, awareness because when you approach the brain using fmri functional mri uh, they there is no single neural correlate of consciousness you are aware you're looking at the subject you ask the subject to perform various cognitive tasks you're looking at the brain and it lights up at different places so it's not at any specific location the brain isn't or uh, or in computers there is no reason at all, in spite of the fact that 50% of these leading people uh, um, in, at this conference in uh, Cambridge thought that computers of the future will eventually become conscious. There is no logical reason why they would ever, ever become conscious because all that computers do is do pattern recognition. You know, they do the kind of stuff that our eyes do. Our eyes are an instrument computers are an instrument, but the eyes are not the experiencing self. In fact, there, is, there are statements uh, in the Upanishads. They say the, sub, the self who is behind the eyes, who is behind the ears, who is behind all our sense organs, because the sense organs, organs are only instruments. The sense organs in themselves do not perform the sensing. So computers do not do any observing. The observation occurs in the consciousness of the individual who uses the computer, right? Now, uh, so uh, what um, the Shiva Sutras and then the, the entire Kashmiri tradition as the other Vedic traditions or yogic traditions in, in India, uh, um, I, I think it needs to be stressed that Kashmir is not unique. It's just one way this whole package was put together. This whole package, meaning the whole system of journeying to self-understanding. And it was put together in similar ways in all other parts of India, in South India, in Bengal, in West India, in Rajasthan, in Middle India, everywhere. So there are different ways of, uh, of, of doing, of being on this path of self-knowledge, because what the Vedas ultimately are not just uh, a plan, a, a program. Uh, what the Vedas say, in fact, in Mundaka Upanishad, it's stated that even the Vedas apara, because they are in language. Whatever is in language can only take you that far. Ultimately, since para cannot be bound in words, therefore, ultimately, you have to experience it yourself. And in Kashmir Shaivism, um, the phrase that is used is shivoham that i am shiva and shiva is consciousness um, shiva is also called prakasha prakash means light that there is light there is materiality which is prakriti and this light and light on materiality our uh, brain is materiality but the light falling on it and the light is transcendent and immanent. This light is everywhere. Shiva is everywhere. But once um, our mind, because who you and I are, who any other individual is, is the mind. We relate to reality through our individual minds, right? And our individual minds are light, prakash, falling on prakriti, on our brains. You know, one way to see it, um, an analogy, analogically, is to look at uh, the idea of a radio. It, the radio does not produce sounds for themselves. The, there are these electromagnetic waves all over and the apparatus on the radio processes that and then is able to produce sounds, right? Now, uh, but this analogy should not be taken too far because consciousness is not a physical process. It's a, it's not a physical process. Um, and so, but it's everywhere. So there is this transcendent presence and that when it projects through as light, uh, which is a term that we are using here for convenience, through our brain, uh, then we see things. And depending upon how we have trained our minds, because ultimately all that we have is our minds, we are able to see this light uh, with, in, in greater brightness or in less brightness, right? And, and so then ultimately uh, it's up to 
uh, it's up to the mind uh, for us to mind now as us to process this light. So where Shiva and once we are one with this light, that's when we are Shiva. And then uh, the whole idea, um, and this is something mysterious, <clears throat> but also <clears throat> uh, expansive uh, and exciting is that Shivoham, I am Shiva. As Shiva, then you have access to uncommon insights. And, and this is something that, um, that all creative people uh, would uh, admit, would confess that uh, the act of, of that creativity generally occurs in mysterious ways. You know, some people speak of um, a vision or you're sleeping or you're frustrated in whatever you're doing and then suddenly out of nowhere that idea comes, right? Or somebody, a, a, the great, a great mathematician such as um, Srinivas Ramanujan, who died very young in his early 30s, did amazing work um, in his uh, teens and, and 20s, self-taught. Uh, he would say, when people would ask him, uh, how did you get these equations? Because we, there's no background or context for these equations in all of mathematical literature. Uh, and in fact, his, uh, he died, I think, uh, 1920 or somewhere, uh, 1917 or 1920. Then his textbooks, uh, his notebooks, um, he died of tuberculosis something. His notebooks were discovered in the 70s and they're still being uh, studied. And a lot of exciting mathematics is still being obtained from his notebooks. So when, before he died, uh, his uh, collaborator in uh, Cambridge University, because he was invited there um, by G.H. Hardy, who was a very leading mathematician of his time, he would ask him, how did you get these equations? And um, Ramanujan would say that the goddess uh, Namagiri or Namakko, uh, would come to him in his dreams. And I think what he meant was lucid dream. And this is what really happens, I can tell you that. And give these equations. And this is just a context or culture related way of saying that this, uh, because goddess is whatever comes to your mind, it's the activity in your mind is who the goddess is. Our mind itself, is the goddess, our awareness of the goddess. And that's how we speak of Saraswati or, 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 or Sharada uh, in, uh, in India. So, uh, or Aparna, Aparna is goddess also. Aparna because uh, goddess in order to get that light must uh, have this vow the light is received only if you have make this vow that I shall receive this light and then you prepare yourself it. So you don't even eat a, a leaf. Parana means a leaf. If you don't even eat a leaf, your vow is so strong. That's when Shiva uh, presents himself to Prakriti. That's where the name Aparna comes in. So Aparna is a goddess too. Saraswati is a goddess of Sharada is a goddess. So uh, what uh, Srinivas uh, Ramanujan was uh, saying was that it was the, it was his mind because it was, it was open. Uh, it was receptive to this Prakash, to this light, which is available to everybody. But you have to be prepared, you know, um, you have to be prepared to receive those gifts. Um, you have to open up your mind. And that's how um, Ramanujan got it. And that is something that everybody can get it. So this is uh, one proof, if you will. If you can show something um, uh, for which uh, there is uh, no uh, antecedent, in terms of, you know, there are two kinds of creative uh, work. One is, which is a slight modification to what has already been there. And you can then see, hey, this is a chair design in the past and you made this slight change, perhaps copying something in nature. And that's how you created something new. Or you make, uh, you try to represent your own uh, understanding 
or uh, impressions of nature as an artist, right? Or sound, you compose something new. Or a lot of research in sciences is using analogies from here and there. So you're in one field, there are certain analogical structures, and then you take them to another field, and then you're able to use uh, mathematical apparatus from one, uh, which is which has been commonly used in one field in another field. So you could do that, but if there is something for which there are no antecedents at all, so that it becomes uh, something full of astonishment, or chamatkar. This is what we say in uh, uh, Kashmir Shaivism, uh, that uh, ultimately you know, uh, you know that indeed something marvelous has happened is through that sense of astonishment that you see within yourself. Now, uh, in uh, the science of consciousness, now this is all, this is all uh, Kashmir Shaivism is a science of consciousness, just as, and it's a subset, it is a re-expression of the Vedic science of consciousness, and Vedas are nothing but a science of consciousness, right? And we have seen the Vedas already do amazing stuff in the very creation of quantum mechanics, which is at the basis of all the modern uh, wonders of science, because without quantum mechanics, you could not have chemistry. Without chemistry, you can't explain biology. Without uh, uh, all of this, you cannot explain how computers work. So everything is based on quantum mechanics. And the creator of quantum mechanics, the Austrian Vedantin, Erwin Schrodinger, himself, as I mentioned already, uh, uh, he credited uh, the Upanishadic Mahavakya, I am Atma Brahma, as giving him this idea that physical reality at the micro level must be a superposition of all possibilities, right? And that's what Prakriti or nature or reality is. Now, there are different ways, uh, the Shiva Sutras and the many commentaries that were written on the Shiva Sutras in many centuries after the eighth century, you know, your great philosophers and sages such as Utpal Deva or Abhinav Gupta or Kshena Raja and so on, many, many others. They've written extensive books where it's all written in a in a very contemporary modern way, they're asking questions of what is reality? What, who am I? How do minds work? Because there's one, there was one theory, for example, I've been uh, studying uh, this vritti or this, this uh, commentary on, uh, on, on uh, Pratya Vigya, which is one of the uh, schools within the science of consciousness, um, or Kashmir Shaivite, Shaivite science of consciousness, where uh, the debate is on this, hey, if, if, we, have, if we have minds um, and minds are only transitory receptacles of memory, then um, why do we even have to invoke something larger than the minds, right? Just as you and I and you are different minds and minds are memories. And that's, that's of course, one way of looking at it. And, Sankhya, for example, speaks of minds as ahankar, meaning ego, um, chitta, meaning bank of memories, and buddhi as meaning intelligence or discrimination. Now, we can have buddhi of one kind or the other uh, embodied by a computer. Pattern recognition is buddhi of one kind, right? But ahankar, ego, or I-ness, we, we, can't, we, don't, we can't program that, right? So... Uh, so the whole thing in one of the uh, schools, there are different schools uh, within uh, Kashmir Shaivism, and the whole system is also called Trika, Trika meaning triplicate, just as the Vedas themselves are called Trai Vidya or triple knowledge. And Trika, the triplicate is Shiva, which is consciousness, Shakti, which is nature of which we are a part, and Anu, meaning the individual self, the individual mind. So there are different ways of being on this journey so that you then are able to discover who you are, namely that you are Shiva. Every human being is Shiva. Shiva meaning Shiva and Shakti are one at that time. It's not masculine and feminine. Sadly, Americans right now are sort of gone crazy talking about gender, but 
it's all consciousness. Each individual is, uh, is Shiva and you can, you can do it in different ways. And uh, one of those ways is that you have a peak experience and a kind of an epiphany. And suddenly in that moment, you know that you're Shiva. And one, one way to understand this is, uh, is to uh, think of, let's say, tiger cub. Uh, tiger, tiger cub is born and abandoned by its mother or its mother dies and then it's adopted by sheep and it grows up with, with, with the sheep and starts bleating like them because it thinks it's, it's a sheep too. And from time to time, it hears uh, tigers roaring in the forest and it gets frightened like the other sheep and runs with them, right? So the tiger thinks this cub as it's grown thinks it's a sheep. And one day it goes to the water to drink water and the water at that moment is clear and it sees its reflection of its face. And in that moment, he's transformed because he discovers that he's a tiger too and he gives out a big roar, right? So that's one way to do it. There are many different ways. And that's what um, the whole Kashmiri tradition, this is a wonderful tradition as somebody really grew up in small villages in Kashmir, so much of wisdom, but sadly we have been driven out. We've, there has been ethnic cleansing of us by, by this group of people who are true believers in whatever and very tragic and this, Tragedy is going to be repeated at so many different places in the world, unfortunately. But uh, they were what our culture was all about. And this is really Vedic culture in all parts of India, done in different ways, was to discover one's true uh, Shiva within oneself. And that discovery is transformative. It is extraordinary experience. Uh, it's also called, in yoga, it's also called Samadhi. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, different ways uh, in uh, Vaishnavites who speak of Vishnu. Uh, you have the great uh, uh, text, uh, Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna himself says uh, in 529, he says, uh, I am Maheshwara within each individual. I am the great Lord within each individual. And in fact, the difference between the Vaishnavite sadhana and Shaivite sadhana is that in the Vaishna, Vaishnavite sadhana, and uh, Krishna speaks of it uh, later on, I think 15, 15, he says, Smriti comes first, memory, which means you go around and learn, study. And from there comes jnana or knowledge. And then as you go out of that peak state, there is apohanam. Apohan means forgetting. So because of the, because of our biology, we have that peak experience, but then we come back to our normal modes of experience. While in uh, Kashmir, in Shaivism, um, for example, in Pratyabhidya, uh, which is recognition, self-recognition, you have Jnanam first, that knowledge is inherent. And from there comes Smriti, that you could not make sense of the world without knowledge. So it's a question of different perspective that uh, what comes first, knowledge comes first, or intuition comes first, or knowledge comes first, right? Uh, because without intuition, you could not make sense of the world, right? And without making sense of the world, you could not have intuition. These are two, uh, two different ways of looking at the same reality. And then, of course, there is forgetting because we are, as biological creatures, when we go into our, our normal self as, as uh, individuals who are part of the larger society and ecology, uh, physically and socially. So we're also a part of that. So to, uh, I, I noticed that uh, I've done my, my 15 minutes. So uh, since we also want some questions, so just to tie up uh, the loose, loose ends, uh, the science of consciousness, as it uh, emerged or as it was restated in Kashmir uh, 1500 years ago or 2000 years ago, and from there it spread all over Central Asia, went even to the Slavic world to 
China and Japan, even now, uh, one of their main chantings that is done in every uh, temple uh, is called Nilakanta Dharani, where they worship uh, Nilakanta, that is Shiva, every day in Sanskrit. So it went all over and it was a way of relating to the world in wonderful creative way, both externally, because uh, this science of consciousness also privileges equally the outer world because the outer world itself is the body of Shiva. That is one way of looking at it. So it privileges out, outer world exploration as much as inner world exploration, but it gives one not only beautiful insights in this one's own uh, individual journey, but also gives one comfort because if you only, if you think that there was only outer world, the life is full of despair as we see in the West in the uh, United States last year, I think 120,000 people died of opiate uh, uh, overdoses. Why are people addic addicted to all of these things? Because culture and education tells them that there is no inner world. So they are in a state of despair. So I think we need sense of consciousness only, not only from the perspectives of, from the needs of scientists, whether they are computer scientists, physicists, neuroscientists, but also from the perspective of each individual, because ultimately each individual is a personal scientist, you know, is, all, is on their own journey. We in the West has, have denied it to them. We have told them there's nothing but the body. There's nothing but physical sensations. And I think we are creating in this day and age, in this day and age of extreme prosperity, we are creating people who feel so hollow that they think that life is not worth living, which is terrible. We need to change that. And I'm glad that Saraswati Sangam is doing all that it's doing because it's much bigger. It's for all of humanity. Thank you, Aparna Ji. Thank you so much, Professor Kak. Uh, to your point about uh, the issues currently that should be addressed with a, with, with a more uh, awareness and consciousness grounding, there's a question from one of the attendees. Uh, he's, he's connecting AI computing powers and progress with human ability to access infinite power. But the end point of that question is what kind of education do we need to all tap into to, uh, to expand using our un unlimited consciousness that the human mind already has a potential of? See, AI, people who believe that AI uh, will do everything, you know, AI will actually become conscious. First, first of all, it's not going to happen. In fact, I've just recently written two papers in Journal of AI and Consciousness, just past two, three months, where the very first one is called The Limits of Machine Consciousness, where I argue that machines will never be conscious. And I also argue uh, from the perspective of neuroscience, why um, human cognition is associated with 25 different categories, exactly the same as we have in, um, in Sankhya. So there are all these parallels coming through. And of course, there are those naysayers who say, how is it possible that these rishis and sages could have had all this intuition? Because consciousness is one. It's not something where you learn things uh, in bits and pieces, which is what you do, which, which is the only way to do when it comes to the outer world. You must learn only in bits and pieces, which is associated with this whole idea of progressivism, you know, science as being progressive. But consciousness, is one, which is why we have these incredible insights, which is why what these rishis spoke, and I can go and speak for hours and days, where in terms of their details, they are relevant, perfectly consistent with modern science. And I can talk of all those convergences, you know, how uh, reality is created by the mind. You know, that's one of those things. Uh, because one could ask as a, as an as someone who uh, should be who should be skeptical, we should all be skeptical, right? We should all approach reality of questioning. We should all approach it by questioning. And one questioning could be, well, if consciousness is apart from physical reality and physical reality is governed by laws, then where do we have freedom, right? And modern science cannot explain freedom. In modern science, at its deepest level, we are all zombies. We don't have any freedom. We are all but. That, does, that couldn't be true. In, the, in Vedanta, an answer was given to it. This has been a part of uh, discussion in the Vedic tradition for a long time. 
um, and the question was how does the deity create because if if prakriti is all according to laws then where is there room for freedom and mm -hmm. the answer that was given was that freedom uh, is exercised uh, through drishti and this is called drishti srishti vad or creation through drishti through observation and that's what quantum mechanics has seen that through observing a physical system by observation of a physical system you can steer the physical state without expending any energy at all because expending of energy is uh, an example of physical interaction but without expending an, an, any energy by observation alone and this is this was done by my late friend the great physicist george sudarshan and his student in a paper in the 1970s and people it's called the quantum zero effect it's been uh, shown in the uh, lab you can steer the state of a quantum steer a quantum state to whatever you want by observing in particular ways or freeze its state so all of those insights uh, are a part of the vedic tradition because if you are because ultimately all knowledge emerges from consciousness and our minds in the vedic system are only instruments minds are not mind is not consciousness mind is illuminated by consciousness but it's not consciousness itself and that's why you can have different mind states and mind can be distracted like a monkey right then that's why you have to train the mind you have to as in the yoga sutras chitta vritti nirodha how do you take those distractions away so that they if mind is compared to a a a, a pool of water and there are all these ripples so that the sun cannot reflect in it in all its glory then how do we calm the surface of this water so that you can then get all the light that there is so from from education perspective uh, should something be included in curriculum in in high schools and uh, specific uh, uh, themes of courses that exposes students to this space beyond what the the traditional science and understanding of the world is oh absolutely and it's it's done very easily because what is the difference between a uh, modern western view of reality which is a physical view of reality although that's not quite accurate because if you talk to the greatest uh, physicists quantum theorists they would say yeah there is also consciousness but let's talk of at the school or college level or the second third tier writers because they see reality only as a mechanism right mm. not the deepest thinkers in the west but uh, what you have to do in school and college is to have material which say that yes you have physical reality you have physical mechanisms but you also have consciousness which is the complementary aspect of physical reality and that is all that is what the vedas are all about the vedas are saying you have physical reality plus consciousness what um, um, western science at the school level is saying that there is nothing but physical reality right so there is this additional perspective and then what the vedas say is that to find consciousness you have to execute a personal journey the outer universe is interesting but the inner universe is equally inter interesting the outer is mirrored in the inner in fact the outer is contained in the inner because all of the universe as we know it exists in our consciousness so consciousness is primary but we cannot be we cannot then live only in the inner because i think the central idea which needs to be stressed over and over again is that you are not to run away from the outer and that's where kashmir's great contribution to the science of consciousness is that this outer itself is the body of shiva so let this also give you delight not just the inner samadhi give you delight but the outer as well right so a proper marriage of uma and shiva right this is one day of the outer and the inner so there is a question again from the para and apara and uh, them never really converging so the question is about what are the risks of comparing apara concepts which are transcendent to para with quantum mechanics or other western approaches which are all apara 
uh, so if if uh, the two never really converge well you know uh, quantum mechanics you have the mathematical apparatus right which is of course a linguistic expression so that is apparat but there are two aspects to quantum mechanics one is its mathematical apparatus we use uh, in different fields but the other is on intuiting what it means which is where your own intuition comes in which permits you to look at it in new ways and that's where para comes in mm -hmm. so the observer is always apart from the apparatus so the self the individual the scientist the true open minded scientist because you can also do countless number of papers just using the mathematical apparatus without understanding what it means in fact 95% of research or published paper is of that kind right it's which nobody is ever going to read so but uh, but the intuition and that's why this intuition cannot be described mathematically as a part of the apparatus so that's always the interpretation that's where what comes in is hey what is the interpretation are you going to follow the many worlds interpretation which is a mechanistic interpretation of quantum mechanics or are you going to follow the um, the orthodox copenhagen interpretation which gives you more freedom to explore your own intuition because you are apart from the apparatus uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, in one of the sutras it's also stated gyanam bandha this is Uh, Shiva Sutra, I think it's the second one, that this um, projection of your understanding itself becomes a becomes a straight jacket. If you now say that the mathematics, the apparatus, is all that there is to it, you know, the postulates of quantum mechanics, then you're stuck. Then you're not going to get any insight. Then you're not going to go beyond it. The insight is always outside of it, and that is the consciousness. that you're talking about and how to teach it that's where uh, it's also stated that um, you, uh, the the upaya you need somebody to 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 inspire you it's all within you but you mm -hmm. that's where the guru the the whole emphasis on guru comes in hey somebody who's going to inspire you hey believe in yourself have faith in yourself follow this path you know because people are also afraid what if i get lost Yeah, so I think the the next question is a lead off of this uh, in terms of, of course, this being an inspirational session. Where where should they explore more to grow from here? That's that's one of the questions. Well, uh, there are uh, the Upanishads, the whole Vedic tradition. The Vedas are all about uh, the science of consciousness. Everything is all about science of consciousness. Now, I just um, uh, put together a book which you can download for free. uh it's on academia it's called the vedic tradition cosmos connections and consciousness it's 423 pages it's out there pdf uh, you can use that as a starting point it's got references and then you can explore whatever direction you want in fact the very last chapter of that book is an essay i wrote uh just some time ago inspired by my own two papers which i published in journal of ai and consciousness and it's called the essay is called proof of the existence of god not the western concept of god as somebody uh, in paradise but god as this inner light within as ishvara as stated in 529 of the bhagavad gita or in the shaivite tradition it's the same you know it doesn't really matter which particular sect of india you're talking about they're talking of the same thing so or brahma sutras so uh, go there as a starting point and i'm sure you'll find if you don't if you don't find it in my chapters you you can you'll find other references that you can explore for yourself so so this uh, para apara and then of course that feeding into the ai systems becoming conscious how do you see that play out so the num the fraction of people who were of the belief that the ai systems will become conscious is pretty high uh and as the systems uh progress develop become more com complex uh how will this issue be resolved as you see it well as as a as a ai researcher myself what we see over the last 50 60 years that uh in the 60s there was this great excitement you know ai uh, at that time 
and then things went down. Then in the 90s, there was neural network, great excitement. And then people discovered limitations. It did nothing but pattern recognition. Then later on, deep learning five years ago, and now it's again ebbing because they discover that even with these deep learning networks, they can totally misclassify things, you know, totally, and they can then they say that this is this or that. So I think this, this is excitement, which is driven by, by uh, sociology, um, um, social groups associated with researchers, you know, something new comes up mm -hmm. and then people are excited and they discover that, oh yeah, it really can't do this. It can do certain things, of course, you know, you can, within certain constrained situations, you can have self-driving car, but those constraints have to be well-defined. But, but it's certainly true. Okay, uh, to, to step back once again, a lot of what human beings do is uh, mechanical, is pattern recognition, a lot of what we do. So we would be replaced by machines in a lot of what we do. In fact, a lot of even literature, a lot of even poetry is, you know, using these same tropes, you know, these phrases. Uh, and then uh, one who is really uh, has uh, deeper knowledge of, uh, of, of, of that literature in, you know, that particular language, you realize, hey, you know, a perceptive uh, critic would know, hey, this is a repetition. You know, I've re seen this before. Right? A young person comes along copying things, you know, which is what uh, a lot of young people do when they're trying to find their own feet. So a lot of what we do will be replicated by machines. So we will be replaced in increasing ways. So there'll be loss of jobs. There'll be huge crisis worldwide. Mm -hmm. There will be jobs, not for 10 billion people, but maybe there may be jobs for only a billion people. So the world is going to see uh, uh, disruption of a kind that nobody can imagine. Mm -hmm. And because what do people do? You know, you all these colleges, you don't need 10,000 universities. Maybe you just need some very great uh, speakers in these studios. And this information is transmitted to everybody. Right? Mm -hmm. So you don't need that. You just need a few factories as Chinese have shown just a few factories there will produce for, for everybody else. So then what are human beings to do? Um, people use to write stories. Now you can probably program, you know, all these uh, romances you can write uh, because they have very definite uh, structure. You can have a computer program uh, churn out these uh, romances. So what are people to do? I think that's a huge challenge. Personally, I think the answer to that is also in the science of consciousness, because ultimately then the answer is for each individual to find that truth within themselves, mm -hmm. right? And that is very, very exciting. That is very fulfilling. And that also shows us the humanity, not, which connects us, which, which only not only is a glory to ourselves, but which connects us to every other individual, every other prani, every other sentient being. You can find pleasure then in also relationship with pets, which people do, you know, without, uh, without all of this, because, hey, they are as wonderful, sometimes even more, human, more wonderful than human beings, right? Uh, because their love is so much more pure. So how can we be in that state of pure consciousness where each one of us is also fulfilled, not only for ourselves looking at in the mirror, but for others who see us. So I think this, is, nice. where, this yeah. is where the changes are gonna happen. And there yeah. will be the greatest changes that nobody has, 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 has any idea of, of the shape those changes will take. Yeah, so, so obviously there is, there's much to cope with uh, going forward as we adopt more and more AI systems and uh, replace ourselves in the, in the process. So I wanted to uh, get to your uh, reference to um, pot of light and that gives a sense of discreteness to consciousness. Is there a concept of collective consciousness and a recipe to grow collective consciousness uh, interim to the Shivoham concept? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, there is something called collective consciousness. Uh, uh, and that collective consciousness is a consequence of the way 
people in a social group are raised because mm. if you are raised them in darkness right they would look at reality in a particular way um, and and you know just imagine uh, afghanistan 2000 years ago was a brilliant place um, perhaps the greatest genius who ever lived panani this mm. is in northwest pakistan uh, the meeting of the kabul and the sindh rivers panani was born there 2500 years ago he created uh, the grammar of sanskrit in 4000 rules you know com program computer program like tools nobody has equal him in that uh, great achievement algebraic rules right great geniuses not him gandhar art okay, beautiful sculpture music philosophy now that same area look at afghanistan you know they're putting mm -hmm. all these women in burqas they're treating them like animals destroying everything why collective consciousness has changed because if you are pushing young children, if you use them, if you treat them cruelly, it's like we all know if you have a dog, a puppy, if you treat it cruelly, it will grow up and be vicious. So societies can do that and that can become a part of collective consciousness. And therefore, ultimately, love is the answer. You know, how do we spread love to transform people? Because everybody deserves that beauty that is within each individual. But then if you have really treated your chil children, your offspring with cruelty, uh, they would then, because within us are also animals, you know, our self consists, is a superposition of all possibilities. The mm -hmm. asuras and the devas reside within us. Everything resides within us. I am Atma Brahma, right? So who are we going to decide to be? If we decide to be asuras or rakshasas, we will become rakshasas. You know, choice is our choosing makes us what we are. So yes, collective consciousness is there and there would be fight of these, there would be this fight of darkness and light at, the, at a societal level also. And that's where, you know, we need all that we need to bring together for the good of all of mankind mm -hmm. because this is this is what every every prani every creature deserves love and happiness thank you very much i thought that that's a wonderful uh, few uh, words to leave this uh, session with uh, thank you so much professor kak for uh, taking time out and and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you everybody for uh, joining us. Uh, we will obviously post this on our YouTube channel and please visit us and uh, follow the other lectures we have had recently. Uh, and once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>